Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to The Pew. I am your host, John Edwards, and I am so excited to bring you another one of these bonus episodes. If you've been listening or following what we're doing lately, you know that normally our podcast is audio, but here lately, because of all the generous patrons and the things that we've been able to procure in the ministry, the video equipment, we've been doing some uh, video interviews in portions of the show with some of our favorite Catholic presenters and priests and speakers, and today is no different. Uh, I am so excited to bring on our guest here in a few minutes. I want to tell you a little bit about him first, but it's going to be Matthew Leonard. Uh, if you don't know Matthew, Matthew is a Catholic author. He's a speaker. He's the founder of the Next Level Catholic Academy, uh, which is a platform that helps radically transform people through just these different programs he has in there on prayer and all kinds of spirituality. He also has a podcast called The Art of Catholic, which uh, I was blessed to go on a few weeks ago, and he's got a great following there and a great show. So check that out. It's been heard in over 190 countries around the world. And he's also featured on a lot of things like EWTN, Relevant Radio, CBS, um, just Sirius XM, all sort of things. But Matthew is somebody that I have found to be a great inspiration when it comes to talking about prayer life. And so many of you guys, whether it's been through listening to the show or following the videos we're doing or whatever, have written in and, and, and just, you know, especially patrons, have asked me, John, like, can we do something on prayer? We've talked about it, but we struggle in so many different ways. So, you know, praying about it myself, the Lord said, you know, there, there's somebody that you should talk to about that. And he put Matthew on my heart. So here we are today. And without further ado, I want to bring up my friend, Matthew Leonard, who's been such such a blessing to, to me and to this apostolate. So Matthew, thanks for being with us. It is my sincere pleasure, John. It's great to be with you. Yeah. Well, as you heard me a second ago, we have so many guys, and you know, you, you've had me on the show, so you know sort of what our ministry is about. It's talking to everyday guys about everyday things. And one of the things that guys talk to me about all the time is just prayer life. I want to be better in my prayer life. I know I need to be praying more, but they just share all these difficulties they have. So I just thought, you know, you, you're so relatable and you talk about this in a way that guys can understand. You're not super up here with it all the time. I don't know if you see my hand, but up here <laughs> with it all the time. <laughs> and, and and you're just so relatable. So I want to start with just a few of those questions. And one, um, gosh, guys are, are saying like, how do I even begin to pray? You know, right now in my life, we're all busy. We got COVID. There's homeschooling going on. I've got all my work stuff I'm trying to do from home now all these extra pressures. So how does a guy even fit in in the importance? What is the importance of having that time in your life to pray? It's a great place to start. And, you know, I think the first thing to point out is that we have to recognize that this is what we're made for. Like mm -hmm. that, having that knowledge and that, that goal in mind that we are made to pray and be in union and communion with God, that drives then what happens, practically speaking, afterwards. And we just don't kind of we don't talk about it that way as Catholics or any Christians, frankly. But this is what literally we are made for union with God and prayer is how we enter into that union. And once you kind of have that in your mind, then you have to get practical and say, all right, uh, I just have to make a decision to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, love is an act of the will. It doesn't mean your emotions and things don't play a, a part in it. But this is how we show our love for God. We make an act of the will and we say, I'm going to do this. And generally speaking, for guys like us, what does it mean? <laughs> it means you got to get up before everybody else does if you're going to have your prayer time for God. Now, it doesn't have to be that way because everyone's schedules are different. I realize that. But all things being equal, the spiritual giants of the church will say that early morning prayer is the best. And the reason why is because that's when you don't have distractions. Right? Mm. You're not thinking about all the things that are going on already, or you shouldn't be. <laughs> it's a lot yeah, easier to sure. overcome them at that point in time. But so what I do practically is in the morning, and, and St. Jose Maria Escrivá calls it the heroic minute, when you're laying there and your head's on the pillow and you're like, oh, I don't want to do this, right? <laughs> yeah. You make that decision and you get out of bed. It could still be dark outside like it was this morning for me. Mm -hmm. And you get your cup of coffee and you, you sit down with the Lord. And that is act in and of itself realize is an act of prayer in and of itself right yeah uh and then you you begin to enter into that communion with the lord but you have to make a decision of the will that you are going to do this and if you don't make prayer a non-negotiable in your prayer life or in your regular life it will be the first thing that's tossed off the list mm -hmm. uh when things get busy and when was the last time you didn't have a busy day 
Yeah. Amen. Amen. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that's, that's the first thing I try to do in the morning is roll out of my bed and let my knees hit the floor before my feet hit the floor and give my day to God. You know, a lot of guys say, well, what do you say? And I say, well, it's different every day. Some days I just say, thank you for waking me up. Thank you for allowing me to breathe. But it's always helped me align my will with you today. Right? Yeah, let you me know, do what you want. Mm-hmm. And what you say to God is going to change as time goes by, you know, sure. just like your, your conversation with somebody that you know really well, you know, like a buddy mm-hmm. or your spouse, when you first meet, you're talking about, you're kind of feeling each other out and you're getting to know yeah. them. But as time goes by, the relationship changes and the types of things you talk about are different. It's the same thing with God. Mm-hmm. So when, when I enter into to prayer uh, at this point, I'm doing it differently than I did when I first started. And a lot of guys will ask me, well, how long should I do it? You know, if I'm going to get up early in the morning, how long do I do it? And I always say, you know, you eat the elephant one bite at a time and you don't want (laughs) to bite off more than you can chew. So 10 to 15 minutes in the beginning, if you've never entered into like quiet meditative prayer with the Lord, 10 or 15 minutes, that's where you start. And it, in the beginning, it's going to be like, like watching grass grow. I mean, that <laughs> is, it's so hard because we just, yeah. don't, we're not practiced to do this, right? Sure. But you'll find as time goes by and you keep doing this and becomes habitual for you that you actually start to desire it. And yeah. so time starts to go by even faster. And the reason why is because like what I said at the beginning, this is what we are made for. Mm. So it's going to be different. And, and sometimes Guys are like, well, what am I going to, you know, what do I say? Well, use the prayer aid, you know, use the Magnificat or use sacred scripture or a saint book. And what you do is you just kind of read through it slowly and you let the Lord speak to you through it. It kind of starts an interior conversation with you and him. And that's the conversation we have with God. And he's going to show you things. And when he shows you things, listen and do it. Amen. Amen. Well, that's, you know, you bring up something when you said get an aid. That was a couple of things that God said. They're like this awkwardness, right? And we've all been there where you sit down and you're like, all right, God, it's you and me. <laughs> you know, and you're like, what's, what's, what's up with you, God? You know, or, or you're just, you don't know what to say. Or you start something like, oh, thou art, who art thou, God of thou, you oh, know, and you start <laughs> spewing all this Shakespearean poetry. Like you, you've never picked up a play, but you're spitting it out all of a sudden because you uh, think God's up there. And I've always had this image of God going like, hey, John, cut it. Like, stop. I just want to, I, I just want to talk to you, right? Like cut all the other stuff and let's just talk. But guys talk to me all the time about that, like just the awkwardness. That's why I don't pray because I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. It's weird, you know, and then, of course, the distractions come in. So what do you have to say about that? Like just combating distractions, that awkwardness. Um, A lot of guys talk about when I try to talk to God, then a woman walks by in the church and I'm thinking of things I shouldn't be thinking of, all those type things. Like what, what do you say to that? Well, let me start with the practical ways of how you can kind of recollect yourself and, and enter into prayer. So when I first sure. uh, will wake up in the morning and I got my double shot espresso so I can get my eyes <laughs> open. Uh, the first thing I do is I always start by inviting the Holy Spirit. You know, mm-hmm. Holy Spirit, come help me to pray. Right. That, that's what we should do. And lot, right now, my my pattern is kind of I'll pick up my rosary. And I will say a couple of decades of my rosary, which kind of helps put me in the mode. And I have something to think about in those mysteries. And then I'll pause and I enter into meditative prayer. And when I say meditative prayer, all I mean is, again, taking um, my Magnificat or uh, breviary or whatever. And like doing the liturgy of the hours, doing morning prayer slowly and just allowing the Lord to speak to me through that. And we have an interior conversation. And when the Lord shows me something, I pause and I kind of interiorly talk about it. Maybe he tells me something I need to work on. Maybe he tells me somebody I need to be nicer to or whatever it is. Right. And so we have that kind of interior conversation and then I move on. And then distractions come in. You're like, oh, no, you know, what, what the, even in an adoration chapel for crying out, because we're all sure. ADD when it comes to prayer. I mean, we just yeah. are because of original <laughs> sin. Yeah. So here's the thing. And this is when I say this, this is going to seem pretty radical in the beginning. Right. But you're going to understand the rationale here in a second. Realize that everything that we do in our life is really ordered to communion with God. That means mm. everything we look at, everything we we experience, all these things are going to impact how it is we talk to God, right? And so if you find yourself in the morning when you're trying to be quiet with the Lord and you are distracted by this, that, and the other thought, first of all, St. Teresa of Avila says, don't get too 
you know, overwhelmed by them. As soon as you realize you are distracted, you just give it back to God. It becomes prayer in and of itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the devil can't win for losing. But when you think about those things that are distracting you, take a minute. And as men, we're good at this. Analyze it. Sure. What is it that is distracting you? Because lots of times these are indicative of the things that you need to work on. Okay. Yeah. So if I'm totally distracted by things at work, maybe I'm putting too much emphasis and spending too much time and I need to cut back somewhere and take a look at what I'm doing there. Right. Um, Maybe I'm thinking about the show I binged on Netflix the night before and I Mm. can't get that out of my head, which brings up a really important point. Recollection for prayer, which is the hardest part of prayer for most people, staying undistracted, Mm -hmm. doesn't start just when you decide you're going to pray. It starts before. And when I say before, eventually it extends to every part of your life. But think about it this way. You're going to your adoration chapel. Are you blasting Van Halen on the way to the adoration (laughs) chapel? Is that going to help you to move into the boat? (laughs) (laughs) 1984 is a good album, right? But that's right. Diver down. Um, (laughs) The the reality is we have to quiet ourselves down, right? So, what does that mean? You turn the radio off, okay? That's like step one. Quiet Mm -hmm. yourself down before you move into your time of prayer. This is one of the reasons why early morning is so good to pray, right? Because you've quieted down from your sleep. But it goes further than that, because oh no, I'm wrestling with this distraction or that distraction. And, and like I, the example I used, maybe it's something I watched on TV last night. And if you find day after day that you are struggling with that same thought that's coming in from the show you binged on last night, you know what? Stop watching the show. And that sounds a little crazy, right? Like, what do you mean stop watching the show? St. Teresa of Avila says that if you continue to do the things willfully that you know are distracting you in prayer, that it's a venial sin. When Mm. I first read that, I was like, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? This is so hardcore, totally. (laughs) But if you think about it, it makes sense because I'm choosing something else over God and my relationship with him. And that doesn't mean you, you know, we become walking monks constantly, but it does mean we have to take a hard look, John, of what it is that we fill our minds with on a constant basis because You know, that's what's going to come to mind. And garbage in, garbage out. Garbage out. That's what I was about to say. You took the words out of my mouth. You know, it brings up an interesting point, too, because I don't think that people think about distractions like that. You know, our mind so often goes to the negative. We don't think about the positive of things. Like even with suffering, you know, we look at it, we go, why do I have to suffer? Why is this happening to me? And we don't ever say, what is God trying to do? through this with me. And what you're pointing out is these distractions right now, we're looking at them as if, oh my gosh, I'm just not going to pray because I'm too distracted all the time. So I just won't do it instead of saying, man, if God is, is maybe God is placing this in my thought right now so that I'll focus on it and get rid of it the way you're talking about. I've never thought about that before. I mean, that, that's a tremendous tip that you've given right there that helps me because I, I get so caught up in ministry things and stuff that are just constantly going through my mind when I'm trying to pray and, and it may be God saying, like, you need to settle down on some of that stuff. Um, man, what a point to make. I, I, I've never thought about it that way before. It, and it's really just a matter of trust. Because when we sure. do those things that are distracting us, like, say it's work stuff, we're mm-hmm. focusing on them. Why? Because there's a problem to solve or we got to do something or sure. whatever. And God, we have to realize that God's our father. And he's going to mm-hmm. take care of those things. Ultimately, we don't, ultimately, it's not us one way or the other, right? Ultimately, yeah. it's all God. Without me, you can do nothing, says Jesus Christ. So we have to trust that he's going to take care of those things one way or the other, and that he doesn't want those things to distract us from our communion with him. At the same time, he's our father. And just like, you know, me talking to my six-year-old boy, Nicholas, you know, he's like this constantly. He's like, you know, dog looking after (laughs) squirrels running across the street. It doesn't, I don't get mad at him for that. I recognize that that's his condition. He's a six year old boy. Yeah, that's where he is. Right. Right. And God, the father looks at us the exact same way. He's always dealing with us in love. And so you don't want to beat yourself up over distractions when you recognize them, identify them, give them back to God and try and do better next time. Sure. Well, you know, here's, here's another thing that guys bring up a lot. And You know, for instance, right now, I'm going through Exodus 90, and part of that holy hour is, you know, you read your readings, you think about them, you pray about them. There's some other steps in there, but it says, uh, take whatever's on your mind 
and give it to God and then be quiet and listen. I think this is where a lot of people give up on prayer is because when it gets to that listen part, you hear the crickets, right? Like it just, <laughs> you're nothing. And so guys are going, <laughs> you know, it's been three and a half seconds. I better, I better quit because I haven't heard God, right? Like, and I feel weird because I'm sitting here and now I'm not, I'm thinking about how I'm not hearing God and all these thoughts that come in your head. So what do you do? Like, how do you tell, or what would you say to men? about how to hear God. Because some people will say, well, I hear God plain as day. Other people say, well, I see things that happen around me. I notice things and and God speaks to me through that. So what's your advice on that to a guy that is trying to listen to God? What should he expect and, and what should he look for? I think it's going to be, first of all, generally speaking, all those things will happen to everyone at some point in time. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to see the Lord act in a particular way through someone else or yeah, I've never heard the audible voice of God in sure. my ear, right? But I know sometimes when God speaks to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, as time goes by, you're going to recognize how he deals with you as an individual, and that comes from experience in prayer. But I would say in the beginning, when you are doing this and you're meditating and you're like crickets and I don't hear God, what am I supposed to do at that point? Sure. Let's say you're using a book, okay? You got your Magnificat or whatever. If I'm reading through something, the Liturgy of the Hours, or whatever the prayers you guys are doing for Exodus 90 or whatever, Mm -hmm. you're reading through it, and you're doing it slowly, right? Because this is meditation. So you're moving through it slowly. When something jumps out at you, that's when you pause, Mm. okay? It's not after every line. It's not after every word or whatever. You're moving through it slowly. Something jumps out. That's when you stop, and that's when you enter into meditative reflection upon it. When that moment has passed and you've had that conversation with the Lord back and forth about it, go back to the reading and start doing it again. See, that reading is really your input into the conversation Mm. with God. And so then he's going to come back and speak to you through it. Now, as time goes by, you're going to get to a place in this in the prayer life where you have this desire to stop doing that. Like you want to take the reading material that you have And you set it aside because all you want to do is be with the Lord. And that kind of comes and goes and is a gentle nudge uh, that just happens very gradually as time goes by. So if you get to that point where you're just like, I don't really want to read anything. I just want to kind of be with the Lord. Obey that. Like Mm -hmm. set it down. And when your mind starts to go all over the place again and you recognize that, then pick your book back up again and start reading. Right. Or whatever it is you're doing. But the reason why that takes place is because really what you're doing is developing a relationship with the Lord. And just Mm -hmm. like I don't want to be reading a book in the presence of my wife, uh, you know, oh, this this book's about my wife. You know, how about that? (laughs) She's sitting across from me, you know, sure. (laughs) I want to be with her. And so that's what happens with us and the Lord. And then as time goes by, your your prayer life really transitions as time goes by. And there there are three major kinds of Catholic prayer. It's vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer. Mm -hmm. Vocal prayer stays with us all the time, right? You never stop doing that. Meditative prayer is really what we're talking about here. And frankly, John, if more guys really understood and practiced meditative prayer— then a lot of the issues that we have in the world and in the church wouldn't be there. I totally because agree. we'd be in a lot more communion with the Lord, and we would know what he wants, and we would receive the grace to be able to go deal with it. Sure. No, you're exactly right. And it, what's so funny is you're talking about becoming comfortable. You're building this relationship. You know, when I go hang out with my best friend, or when I got on here with you, it wasn't like, geez, what am I going to say to Matthew? Now i got to think about what i got to say to Matthew. <laughs> like before we started the interview, we're friends, right? There was no, yeah. even the preparing for this interview, it's like, you know, God, God's going to give us plenty of things to talk about. We have some starting points, but God's going to give that to us. But for some reason, we go into our relationship with God very differently than we do with all the other relationships in our life. And there's this almost this gargantuan expectation we put on ourselves to present, to to uh, to be something that we're not. And I got to tell you, a lot of people ask me, and we made a joke about this in the beginning when I prayed before we started, how Protestant I sounded. Well, I was raised Protestant, 
And but but it's also helped me be able to just have a conversation with God, right? Like when I speak to God, I speak to him like he's like it's my friend that I'm talking to. Like we're sitting down on a park bench for a few minutes together to catch up. And and I think that's so difficult for a lot of men, especially a cradle Catholic, for instance, that it may be a little bit harder where you've been raised with, like you said, these these uh ritualistic prayers and these things that we say. They can almost come off as like, how many times have you been in mass? You're saying our father and you're on the sec- second to last word and you don't even realize you said it, right? right. Like it, the, the meaning's gone. It just rolls off the tongue. And and I think so many guys struggle with that too, is, is how do I move from that ritualistic, I know it, I'm going to say it, I'm supposed to do a Divine Mercy Chapel at noon and three, you know, all of those things. How do we move from that into that more relational prayer that you're talking about? Well, Prayer at its core is a movement of the heart, right? Mm-hmm. That, that's what it is. In fact, you know, a rosary, your breviary, all those other things, technically in and of themselves, they're not prayer. Those are the means to move us into prayer. So it's always mm-hmm. a movement of the heart. And when we're talking about the formula prayers that we have, some of you know, the Our Father was taught to us by Jesus. So sure. <laughs> this is not to be derogatory of the Our Father or Hail sure. Marys or any of the rest of it, right? Those are powerful, powerful prayers, and we need to pray them all the time. Even Jesus as a Jew learned all the prayers of, of his time. What we have to make sure of is that when we enter into them, that we are thinking about what it is that we are saying. And we make an act of the will, again, that we are— that that this is something I want to focus upon. So even if your mind wanders a little bit, realize if you make that act of the will in the beginning, like, Lord, I want to do this. I want to do this right. You know, the Lord respects that. Okay, you're sure. praying. But the more you can get to the point where you are thinking about what it is that you are saying, that becomes more and more prayerful and more and more powerful. And how do you get to the place where you you can do that constantly? Um, <laughs> this is what St. Paul talks about. Uh, you know, praying constantly. That's what we're supposed to be in the mode of. You can't enter into those times of finite prayer. So your Our Fathers, your Hail Marys, and all the rest of that kind of stuff by flipping a switch. It doesn't Mm. work like that. You have to live in a state of prayer. And the visual that I I often use is, is that of like coals of a fire, you know, like on the grill. But imagine those coals down in your soul. And... (laughs) They're constantly lit by by staying in a kind of a, a state of prayer. And that doesn't mean you're walking around muttering to yourself, you know, at the hardware store. It just <laughs> means you're living in this kind of ongoing relationship with the Lord where you're you're talking to him, you know, throughout the day. And you have those set times during the day that you're going to do your divine mercy chaplet or say your Angelus at noon or whatever. But those times you enter into the finite prayer, like your divine mercy chaplet. Sure. That's like the breath of the Holy Spirit coming in and blowing across those coals and igniting mm. the flame of love inside of you, right? And you're focused on God at that point. But it's not something you can just hot and cold whenever you want. You have to get into the mode of relationship. And again, it's kind of it's pretty practical. You pray in the morning. You yeah, you know, sure. set a time at, at noon and say the Angelus. It takes a minute, you know. Sure. It's better of kind of it's like interruption marketing almost. You know, take yourself out of the day and put your back yourself back into the 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 place of relationship with the Lord who made you. And then you're going to find that the times when you try and enter into prayer, even when it's not your set times, you're going to be a whole lot more focused than you would be otherwise because you're attuned more to the Lord. That that's the. Mm-hmm. It's the rocket science behind it, and it's not rocket science. Sure. Well, one of the guys, one of the patrons asked me to ask you this, too. You've been talking about the rosary and some of those prayers like that that, that we've learned and, and all do. And sometimes, I mean, let's be honest, it's hard to pray the rosary by yourself and not get distracted and not really? find yourself going, Hail Mary, full of grace, Hail Mary, full of grace, Hail Mary, full of grace. You know, <laughs> trying to get through it. Like, I used to, I used to try to pray one every night before I went to bed, and I literally felt God put in my mind one night, just put it down. Because it was 9.48, I wanted to be in bed at 10, and so I was speed rosary in, right? Like, boom, 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 boom. I wasn't even concentrating on the mysteries. And he was almost like, just put it down. Because at this point, you're, you don't want to be here. I don't want it that way. Uh, you know, this sort of conversation we had. Well, I have somebody that, that asked me specifically, I'll read it because I don't want to mess it up. But he says, when praying the rosary with family, 
What are some things we can do to make it more prayerful, quotes, rather than feeling like something you need to grind through to get it done? I think a lot of guys feel this sort of stuff all the time when they're, they feel like, I need to pray with my family, so let's just get it done, and then I can move on to whatever else I've got next. How do you feel like, how do you make this a moment of, of true prayer versus feeling like you're just checking a box and grinding through something? It's hard. And, and if you expect your family rosary, I have six kids and they're from 18 down to three years old and it's mayhem at times. It just (laughs) is. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. So don't expect like you're going to be in the cathedral of Notre Dame with angels singing (laughs) and all the rest when you're trying to pray your family rosary that I don't know that family. I hate that family if they exist. All right. I hate the majority. The holy family, yeah. for crying out loud. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I do, practically speaking, is that I know that my younger kids in particular, I, they, they just have a difficult time focusing for that sure. amount of time. Now, I wish they could, but I realize that they don't yet. The older kids, yeah, they're fine. But what I'll do is I will... Uh, I'll start the rosary. For example, on Sundays, I will start the rosary in the car on the way to mass, uh, that day so that when we come back as a family later, it's not quite as long, uh, Mm. when we're all together to do it. And that's just one of the kind of practical things I've noticed as a father seems to work well for our family. One of the things that we've done as well to help kind of keep interest. And so it's not a grind is we went and we bought some really beautiful, uh, images of the mysteries oh, wow. and, or I found a place online as well. And so we are praying in a living room. I put it up on the flat screen, you know, and oh, so yeah. it gives people something to focus on as well. I also make sure to let the kids, uh, give their own intentions. They have to mm-hmm. realize that th- there's a purpose to this, right? We're praying for other people. We're praying for our relationship with the Lord, but it gives them some ownership in it. And then I let them lead, you know, each a decade themselves. Um, those are kind of the practical things that I do. But again, it, it kind of goes back you know, to your point about speeding through the rosaries and stuff. St. Francis mm-hmm. of Sales and I think it's Teresa of Avila say that one fervent Our Father or one fervent Hail Mary is worth far more than a bunch of rosaries you just kind of blow through. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's a movement of the heart toward our Father. That's what it is. That's all prayer is. And so you want to be able to engage that. So as a dad, you know, even if you're not a dad, whatever, whoever you're praying the rosary with, even if it's just yourself, think about those things, practically speaking, that help you do that. Mm-hmm. You know, another thing that I really, I think guys ask about a lot is, because I've done this in my own life, where sometimes it's just been a really busy day. And, and I look back, I'm like, man, I forgot to get up and pray. Or, you know, but I went to Mass. But I don't think about, you know, I, I didn't stop and take five minutes here, ten minutes there. But sort of... Throughout the day, I look back over it in my nightly exam and maybe, or just looking back over my day in general and say, you know, I, I didn't sit for that 15 minutes, but my kids came to me and said, dad, would you play Uno? Dad, would you come and watch me draw this? Would you? And I took time to stop and do those things or driving down the road and I'm asking God, Hey, can you help me make decisions? Like, what would you, what, which way would you want me to go? Like all day long, we're moving and and I think that sometimes we can un, we can misunderstand that our whole life can be a prayer, right? Like I I want to know your thoughts on that because there's been several times in my life where I've looked back and I've sort of felt bad, you know, that I, I didn't stop and hit my knees and and physically you know do all this, but but God has sort of spoken to me and said, but you did this and you did this and you did this. You died yourself in this way for your children today. You died in this way about something else. Can that be a form of prayer in our life? What's your answer to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that all things being equal, you always want to, to the best of your ability, set that specific time aside of the day to commune with him, just you and him. That's just designed for prayer, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what? There are days when I'll get up at O Dark Hundred and one of my kids still wakes up. And yeah. then I have to flip the switch and go from being, you know, guy praying to dad. And in the beginning, when I really kind of got fired up, like like really fired up about going deeply into the life of prayer years and years ago, I remember fighting against this. Like mm. I would still keep the door closed 
and I know there's a kid outside crying and maybe needed a diaper change or whatever. And I'd finish my prayers and thinking that that was the right thing to do. And sure. it wasn't at all. And St. Francis de Sales hammers this constantly. Sure. You have to live your life as a Catholic man according to your vocation. Whether or not you're single or married or a priest or religious, whatever, it's according to your vocation. So if my kid wakes up and it interrupts my prayer time, that's the way it is. And I, you're exactly right. I am acting uh, – I'm giving my life in prayer and in self-sacrifice to take care of the needs of my child. And if I get to the end of the day and I didn't have that time set aside that I really wanted to have and, and you know, traveling, you know, we travel and speak and stuff. And sometimes sure. you're on planes and all the rest of that kind of stuff. I just don't get that opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says, OK, you know, I mean, John, look, if you and I had a set time, let's say you and I had a set meeting. Right. And in the morning and mm -hmm. and one of us had to miss it and you apologize to me or I apologize to you. We're not going to hate each other for that. You know, we're no. brothers in the Lord. Yeah, <laughs> dude, I totally understand. You had to go take care of your kids, whatever. That's totally cool. God, our father is the exact same way. He's not going to beat us upside the back of the head because we're taking care of the kids that he gave us to take care of or whatever things we have to deal with. So it's the same thing. So, again, generally speaking, have the time set aside. If you can get back to it, great. If you can't, don't kill yourself about it. Just get it back on the horse tomorrow and do it again. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently you haven't been getting my calendar invites. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. For that, that pre I feel better. I thought you were just ignoring me, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but here's another thing I want to bring up, too. It just came to me while you were talking. So we've talked a lot about individual prayer with God. We've talked a little bit about praying rosaries and things with family. Here's something that I know a lot of guys don't do, and I'm going to be honest. I'm very bad about this myself, and I want to get better about it. I, I was good at it for a while, but it, like a lot of things fell by the wayside. Praying with our spouse. You know, I know a lot of guys say, I want to pray with my wife. Um, and they get in that sort of, do we hold hands and stare into each other's eyes? Do we, you know, I mean, all the awkwardness that can come from that and, you know, and, and a guy sitting there saying, well, I want to pray with you and, and hoping his wife saying, well, I pray my husband becomes a better husband or whatever. You know, there's these opportunities for awkwardness there. So how important is it that we're entering into prayer on a pretty regular basis with our spouses and joining together for whether it's praying for our families or for our future or for the country, whatever it is, how important is it to be entering into prayer with our spouse as a joint effort? Well, you're going to I'm going to hoist myself on my own petard, so to speak, because it waxes and wanes <laughs> in my life as well. It's it's sure. one of these hard things. And I'll say it, I mean, not to make an excuse, but when you have kids and and they're going to bed at different times and all the rest of it, I finally get to see my wife, you know, like really sure. see her late at night. Now, mm -hmm. that said, um, there have been periods in our lives where we have, we, we are praying together Um but it waxes and wanes. I am I am weak in this regard, just as you admit to as well. And it, mm -hmm. this is something we try and do, and we'll kind of get back up on the on the horse during Lent, right? Mm -hmm. um, what we tend to do when when we're in this kind of mode of doing it is we'll just use night prayer, because as part of the liturgy of the hours, evening prayer or night prayer. And what we'll do is we'll go back and forth. You know, I'll say the first part. She says the next part. and We kind of go back and forth. And then we get to the end. We'll say petitions. Okay. And it removes a lot of the, you know, the kind of awkwardness and whatnot. My wife's a cradle Catholic. I'm not. I'm like you. I'm a convert. And so yeah. I, it's really easy for me to just, you know, start talking. And she was just raised in a different mode. Right. And her sure. personality is very different than mine as well. So that's that's what we do, practically speaking. And I'm going to be preaching to myself again here. It's super important because our vocations, um, you and I are, mm -hmm. we're married men, right? With families. What do you think the evil one's going to attack in order to get to us? It's our families. Yeah, our family, yeah. You know? And so the more we can pray, not just with our kids, but with our spouse, and I would say even one on one, like you're talking about, the stronger that relationship is going to be, and the more likely our kids are to stay in the church. And get to heaven and join us. I mean, really, mm -hmm. at the at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's the goal, I want to yeah. help her. Yeah, I want I want every one of them. And I beg God for my kids on a daily basis, and my wife, and I pray for our marriage. And us just talking about this kind of convicts me. I'll probably do night prayers tonight with my wife, and then sure. I'll probably stop doing it another <laughs> week, and then try and get back up on the horse again because I'm a human. You know, it's super important. <laughs> 
Yeah, it is. Well, Matthew, what you know? What uh, what prayers do you fall back on in your own life? I know there's a lot. I, I'm a guy that prays. <clears throat> excuse me, the litany of humility, uh, the litany of trust, a lot. Um, some St. Joseph prayers. I mean, there's some things I, I tend to pray more personally, you know, to God with just a conversation. But when I do pray um, in, in some of these prayers that the gifts of the church that we've got, you know, we've received, litany of humility, things like that, what do you find very helpful in your own spiritual life that you pray often? Um, I often will do the morning prayer and the liturgy of the hours. Okay. I pray a rosary every day. And the reason why is because our lady asked us to. And yeah. so I'm like, all right, that's good enough for me. You yeah, know? no argument there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but those are, I mean, those are the kind of the two main, sometimes I'll just do Lexio Divina with scripture directly itself. Mm-hmm. But I would say if it was set prayers that I was falling back on, it's the rosary and it's, it's morning prayer. Sure. Um, I, I said before that your prayer life kind of evolves, you know, as your relationship with the Lord changes. And so you will get to a place where even those things, not, I still pray a rosary every day, but the way that I meditated back then is different than the way that I do now, just again, because my relationship is different with the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so there may be many days where I don't even pick up my Magnificat or bravery. Um, I'll still pray my rosary. But I'm just sitting and being quiet with the Lord, and uh, that's how it is that we're communing uh, at that point in time. And that, you know, it's kind of an ebb and flow. But those set prayers are really the ones that I fall back on. And a memorare. Sometimes I'll do these, like, novena, mem- like speed yeah, novenas sure. of a memorare. Yeah. But uh, doing that and, and uh, you know, doing the, the consecration to Our Lady as well, that kind of strengthens your rosary. So I've done that as well. Sure. I've done some novenas, 54 day. I think I wound up doing like seven rosaries in one day because I fell that far behind. <laughs> but you know, that's hard when you're like, man, I'm on my sixth rosary for the day. But hey, you know, it's, it's, we all, we're all human. One thing I want to ask you too, I know we're getting here towards the end of the time, but I want to, you know, you brought up scripture, you brought up praying, and you mentioned Lectio uh, a couple of times. I know you've given a talk on that in one of the virtual Catholic conferences. I think it was on Steve Ray's Take and Read. Would you just quickly, you know, explain that 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 uh, principle of lectio? And because I think that's where a lot of guys we read the Bible and we read it as black words on a white page. It's another history book, another story. We kind of already have read it, but we don't prayerfully go through it. As you said before, we don't always invite the Holy Spirit to to explain, to give us the wisdom to understand it. So, would you talk about that for a minute and how important that sure. is in reading Scripture? Yeah, you know, all Lexio Divina means is divine reading. It's just basically Mm -hmm. reading and praying over sacred scripture. And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before with regard to meditation. You take scripture and you start reading through a passage, likely the Gospels. They're the most important Mm -hmm. because they're about Christ and the words of Christ. Right. And you start reading through them. And this is your meditative function in Lexio Divina. You're reading slowly. As soon as something pops off the page at you, you pause and you enter into prayer over it. But what's really interesting about this that a lot of people just don't think about is that Lexio Divina doesn't end with that prayer. It mm. ends in contemplation. Yeah. Uh, th- those are the kind of the four basic steps of it. But con- what is contemplation? We haven't really talked about this, but contemplation is the highest form of prayer you get to in the spiritual life. Mm. And it is something altogether different than everything else we've been talking about. Because when you move into contemplation, this is not you doing something. It's God doing something to you. To you. So he yeah. begins to infuse himself into you, right? And he's filling you up with himself. You set the stage through these other kinds of prayer that you and I have been talking about and living a life of virtue. You show God you want to move into that kind of deep relationship with him. And then he starts to slowly fill himself, put himself into you. Right. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to what I was talking about before, where you get the desire to kind of set your books down and just be with the Lord. Those are the beginnings of infused contemplation. So the Lord is beginning to fill you up. You're drawn to him. You just want to be with him. That's where Lexio Divina actually ends. And sure. you can't get there overnight. It's like walking into a weight room, you know, the first time when you're a 98 pound weakling, you just don't start, you know, throwing up 325 on the bench, right? Sure. It's something sure. you work up to. It's the same thing in the prayer life and in Lexio Divina. You move toward that goal and eventually he will start to give it to you. And you keep setting the stage by reading and praying slowly over scripture and then praying about what it is the Lord talks to you about. And then he'll move you. But it also shows you 
that if you're going to read and pray over sacred, sacred scripture, you better know the story of the Bible, sure. right? Because so much <laughs> of Lexio is knowing the story. You're making connections about here, there, and everywhere. So, you know, David wasn't the guy on the ark, you know, it wasn't <laughs> Abraham who led the Israelites out of, sure. you know, Egypt. You got to know these kinds right. of things because the Lord will bring things to mind to bring connections to scripture as you're praying over it. And that's a huge part of Lexio Divina. So get familiar with your Bible Catholics. I mean, it's our mm-hmm. book for crying out loud, and it can really transform your prayer life if you pray over it. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, one thing you've said a lot here, and I know we're here at the end of the time, is it prayer is an act of the will. You know, guys, if you're listening to this, it's no different than repentance or anything else. You have to decide this is something you want in your life. So if you are trying to figure out how to pray, you've got to make it something that you're going to make a priority in your life. Matthew's made an excellent point of that. He's talked us all the way through these different forms and types. Matthew, like I knew this was going to be a great interview, but I mean, again, you exceed expectations as you always do in our conversation. So uh, I want to give you a, a couple minutes here. Guys, obviously Matthew's pretty uh, pretty practiced in this. So Matthew has the Catholic, the Next Level Academy. And some other things there, Matthew, will you, will you tell us for a few minutes, you know, where they can find more, what kind of stuff they can expect and, and where to just dive into everything you have? Now, thanks, John. Um, yeah. yeah, nextlevelcatholicacademy.com is the place where I do most of my work. And the premier course at the academy is called The Science of Sainthood because the mm. spiritual life isn't a free for all. It, there really is a science of sainthood according to the saints. And so I've spent the last two and a half years putting together an entire set of more than a hundred videos that are like wow. bite-sized videos with meditations and saint passages and stuff that literally walk you through the stages of the spiritual life in the way that the spiritual giants have set it up. So it's A to Z, uh, just how you become a saint. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's such a cliche for us, but it shouldn't yeah. be. That's the goal. And there really is a method to the madness of becoming in a part of the divine madness of God, if you want to put it that way. So that's what is in next level Catholic Academy. And, you know, for the guys who are watching, um, right now, if you want to, I've tried, I've been trying to think of easy ways to get people into this so they can taste it and see what it is. And if you guys just pull your phone out and text the word saint to six, six, eight, six, six. So saint to six, six, eight, six, six. You can jump in and experience the Academy for free for a couple of weeks and kick the tires and see whether or not it's something for you and if it, it kind of speaks to you. Uh, and you can stick around after that if you want. Um, but one way or the other, you got to get on the road to God, right? And you got to know what it is that you are doing. Uh, otherwise, you're just not going to get to where you're going. Because if there is an end goal, that means there is a path to get there. And we need to know what that is. And unfortunately, this is something that Catholics just haven't been taught for a long, long time. We're really ignorant when it comes to what are the, the spiritual particulars that we need to engage in in order to get to yeah. God, right? Amen. And but it's there. It's there in our tradition. And when I discovered it, it transformed my world. And I just want to share that with anyone and everyone because it is the public secret of the Catholic faith. Yeah, well, you can tell by your passion and everything you're doing out there that it's had a profound effect on you guys. Go check out his stuff. You also have Patreon, right? So you've got a way for people to support you in the ministry. Can you tell us where we can find that? Yeah, patreon.com slash Matthew Leonard. That's there. I'd appreciate all the support. Thank you. Yeah, guys, it's been a pleasure to be with Matthew here. Matthew, you just... It's been awesome, just more than I even expected, and I expected a lot with you, but it's even more. So, uh, guys, speaking of patron, we have patron here, just a guy in the pew, as you know. Um, We are going to jump off of this main interview, and we're going to film something else for the patrons. We do this a lot on all these interviews that you've seen lately with Jason Everett and Father Larry and all these different folks that have blessed us by coming on here. We spend extra time for the patrons. You also get uh, deeper dives into the podcast that I do every week. There's merchandise. There's access to The Narrow Road, the new book that we're coming out with every month for men that's going to help them walk towards virtue and holiness. So if you want to become a patron, you want to hear some extra episodes and keep enjoying Matthew, then you can do so by going to patreon.com slash pew ministries, or you can go to just a guy on the pew.com and click support and sign up there. So Matthew, again, it's been a pleasure to be with you, my friend. Always a joy. And thank you for coming on. It is my pleasure, John. God bless all you're doing. All right. Thank you, brother. We'll see you soon.